Hello, everybody. My name is Andrea Marchiodi, and I'm, I'm the current director of the, the Georgia Mathematical uh, Research uh, Center. So I would like to welcome you to the, to the meeting, uh, Modeling Analysis uh, and Control of Multi-Agent Systems Across uh, Scales. Uh, I will just say a few words, uh, and I promise I won't take much of your time. Uh, I just would like to say a few things about the, the Georgia Center, which was uh, founded about 20 years ago. Uh, formally as a research laboratory of uh, Scuola Normale Superiore, but uh, with the goal uh, of being uh, of creating opportunities uh, for the mathematical community in Pisa to gather, also with uh, people, of course, uh, outside, from outside Pisa. Um, so it is uh, supported, uh, apart from uh, Scuola Normale, also from the University of Pisa, and uh, also um, in a small portion from the Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna. And uh, both uh, institutions, uh, especially the former, also contribute uh, crucially to the activities of the, of the center. So since the founding of the center, the main activities have been uh, schools, uh, workshops, uh, research, uh, intensive research periods. And recently we also restarted a colloquium uh, series named after the Georgi. We have uh, visiting positions of uh, two types. Uh, one type is uh, to run uh, research in pairs, so for a short term. And we also have a, a two years uh, postdoctoral uh, positions. So typically deadline is in January, it's just passed, uh, but uh, just for you to know. Uh, I just would like to conclude uh, thanking the uh, organizers uh, for bringing up this uh, very nice event uh, and also the staff of the center for their constant uh, support. Okay, enjoy the meeting. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marco Morandotti and I'm one of the organizers. And uh, after Andrea's uh, words, I, I join him to in, in thanking the Centro di Ricerca Matematica Nio de Giorgi, as well as the administrative staff of the center who helped us very much uh, in the organization. And uh, on behalf of my co-organizers, uh, um, Giacomo, Stefano, Nadia, and Francesco, who is joining us later, I would like really much to welcome you all to this, to this workshop. Um, it's, it's nice to see you here. We try to bring together uh, people from different communities to discuss uh, modern problems uh, in, uh, in multi-agent dynamics, and we hope that uh, all of you have a good time here. All right, our second speaker is uh, Michael Herty from uh, RWTH Aachen, and uh, his talk is about uh, multi-agent systems for multi-objective optimization problems. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you also for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. and tell you something about recent work, which uh, in particular we did with uh, Giacomo Borghi, a recent PhD student of um, mine and Lorenzo Pareschi. Um, and it's very beautiful that we had this talk about the swarms before. So uh, here you don't see swarms, right? So there's no swarm here, but um, there is a very stro a strong connection, I must say. So where uh, many people model swarms giving some physical behavior and they wanted to understand why the shapes appear. Here we have an um, optimization view and we say maybe we can design a particle system or a swarm system which attains a certain shape. And this shape should, for example, be the minimum of some function. So then you would like to have it concentrated. like, um, Or it should, like in the multi-objective case later, should maybe attend a certain shape which could be the Pareto front, so the front of optimal points. And so the question is that we want now to use swarms or agents with um, with a different purpose, right? So not describing a physical system, but solving some other problem which can be possibly posed using these agents. And uh, what is also very nice is that somehow the same ideas as we have seen in the previous talk reappear. So I will also talk about potentials later because potentials drive the dynamics in a certain way. And as we have seen before, so potentials can be used somehow to um, describe certain shapes which might appear. And so we want to utilize this, right? We did utilize that for this multi-objective thing. Um, so again, so there's no physical problem here. There will be a mathematical problem. There will be agents which will follow some dynamics and which hopefully then lead to a final state or shape of the system, which solves then uh, another problem. Um, yeah, so there's not much about fluids, but I would like to add this in the outlook. So maybe there's also a way to add this. This was a nice... Uh, thing we could maybe talk about. So the um, so there will be now two slides which have nothing to do with swarms and then there will be the particle dynamics. And uh, because the first two slides will now set up what kind of problem I actually want to solve. And um, probably all of you are familiar with that, but I need to introduce this notation. 
So we are interested in multi-objective minimization. So you are given a finite number of m objective functions. I will say something on the regularity later. Um, and uh, you want to uh, minimize this um, object. And now the question is, what is a typical tool or what is a notion of minimum? And then you check the literature and there is what is called Pareto optimal. So this just means that you have, you look for a point X in a finite dimension space um, such that you cannot improve any of those simultaneously, right? And the typical picture, um, and there's weak Pareto optimal and Pareto optimal. So um, this has something to do with the reformulation we do later. So we will look later for the weekly Pareto optimal points. The typical picture, which is maybe more intuitive than this is maybe that one here on the right. So you have on the one axis, you have maybe one cost functional, say the G1. So this is the case shown as the case where M is two, right? So you have one uh, objective with its G1, you have another one with its G2. Then for each point in X, you get um, you get some some point, say in this um, in this red region. And then you are looking, what are now the optimal points? The optimal points would be precisely, let me do it here, this line. Because um, on this line, you cannot improve both G1 and G2. So we are want to minimize. So this would be the ideal point. We cannot reach that, um, but we would be on this phase space. Okay, so we would, in the end, what would be what should be the outcome of our minimization would be nice to have some kind of parameterization of this curve. So this would be somehow I view this as the same as uh, the desired outcome of a previ of your of, from the previous talk, where you either have, for example, the mill or some concentration. So I want my particles to be spread along this line because maybe then some other um, engineer or some colleague who is interested in the solution could then decide which point he would actually take. The thing is that, okay, I cannot do this in this image space directly, so I would like to work on the point space. So I need to find this X such that the mapping G, which gives me then these points, would map from some curve here to this curve. And um, so I want to describe a dynamics here for the particles. So here there will be particles in the end which will move around so that they will be at some time sp spread, hopefully, somehow, in some sense, equidistant along this Pareto form. This would be the goal. Um, it's drawn here that this curve is uh, continuous, but uh, in the end, we will have we have also results where this curve is uh, discontinuous. So this is just an illustration. So how to proceed? Um, so the first thing what we do is, um, in order to get a more tractable formulation, we do what is called scalarization. This is also not new. This has been known uh, for a long time. So the idea is that instead of, let me, oh, sorry, let me go back one slide. Instead of having these M functions, I want one cost function, which is always now called capital G. And in order to somehow remodel this problem into one function, I need an additional parameter, which will be always W, and which could is a set of parameters, in fact. And so um, this means that I transform this problem into a parameterized problem now for G, which depends on the, of course, on X, but also on this parameter M. The simple one is that you say that instead of minimizing all of them, I just minimize the convex combination of these cost functionals. The question is, of course, once you minimize this type, what do you get back? Do you get some Pareto optimal solution if you vary this parameter W? And um, so the result is already here. So we would like to use something like this um, because then we know that if we um, scalarize with the maximum of this function, then when we find a solution for fixed W, then this is also a point on the weak Pareto optimal front. So this would be a good scalarization strategy. This is also a good strategy, but uh, only for convex problems, and there are other choices. One important point is that, um, I mean, um, here, if you already look at this formulation, you see that this will give you a non-differentiable function. Right? So the minimization you still have to do for capital G needs to be able to somehow cope with this non-differentiability. So again, you have this multi-objective function, you reformulate into a single objective function with a parameter, and this parameter lives on this um, simplex of convex combinations which add up to one. 
So this is a subproblem. And now we come to the particles. So the idea is um, once I have a formulation like that, I can, and this has been around also for a long time, use what is called the Laplace principle to find an approximation to its minimum. And this has, this has there's, I, I didn't put any references, but there are also in this audience plenty of people who worked on this kind of problem. So the idea is, let me start here. If you want to minimize this function, what you can do is you can essentially average uh, the exponential of minus alpha times g against x over um, the set of particles, say concentrated at some points, normalized. So this is just a normalization of this term. And if you drive alpha to infinity, this is what the Laplace principle say, you get back the actual minimum of this function. You see here, no differentiability required on g. You don't need to evaluate gradients. Um, um, and this is what is called the Laplace principle. And now the idea is that, okay, I pick particles. Um, in the end, when the alpha gets large, this quantity should go to the minimum. So which means that this mean of the particle somehow um, should be a good approximation of my current minimum. So this is uh, just a particle approximation of this integral. And um, so this could be a good term. And now I can start to model, similar to what we have seen actually in the previous talk. What I can do is I can say that if this is a good approximation for, say, finite alpha to the minimum of this cost function, then let the particles drift toward this point. So before we had everything was written in velocity space, so these are first order models. So this is just a part, a simple particle dynamics. I let my particle drift to this x alpha point, which is somehow an approximation of the minimum on the set of the current particles. And then, because um, clearly this is a biased approximation in the sense, I can only evaluate at the current points. So I will also add some noise and let them diffuse a little bit. And I want to turn off the diffusion once they are at this minimal point. Okay, so therefore the diffusion should depend on this distance. So here, you see that this was now written without any parameter, but uh, of course, on the next slide, you can do the same thing if this g depends on the parameter. So, but again, in order to relate this a little bit to also what we have seen before, so here the particles would be the positions which should move in the original state space towards the minimum, and the minimum itself is a quantity which I can at least approximate by this Laplace principle, and which gives me a term like this. Which would also mean that, okay, as more particles, clearly I can explore more space. Um, there are nice advantages. Advantage, as I said, of this method has been discussed by many other authors. Also, is G non, not necessarily differentiable is required. The disadvantage is that, okay, the, the result formally holds only when alpha tends to infinity. Choice of alpha is usually not, not clear, and strongly problem dependent. Um, but at least um, it's a particle approximation to a minimization problem given by a drift plus a diffusion. And so now you can start with a kind of analysis of this problem. Clearly, I can do the same thing now if I have a parameterized problem. So instead of now minimizing this little g, which only depends on x, I have my capital G, which is this scalarization of this multi-objective problem. So you can think of this as a convex sum of these cost functionals or as the uh, maximum of those. I have, of course, to respect that this w belongs to this simplex. And of course, for every fixed w, I get a point. I get a desired minimization point. This would be one point on the Pareto, uh, so the G of, the, if, if I apply the, the, the little G to this one, I would get for each W a point on the Pareto front. Um, and so now the first simple thing you can do is now you can say, okay, let's fix W and just run these particle dynamics. And then this happens. So you have, this is the search space, the X space. This is the image space, again, written only for M equals two, the so two cost functionals on the X and the Y axis. And you start with some uh, particles, which are these uh, gray grosses, and you have a fixed W. Um, and as you see that they nicely um, somehow converge towards a point on the 
on the op on the on the curve of optimal points, and similarly, they converge to some point on the Pareto fault. Now, of course, you can change W and then get a different point. Um, but okay, clearly this is maybe not the most clever strategy, and this would be quite expensive. So instead, we use something else, which um, we could also see if we go back here. I said that it's good to use more and more points. So in principle, you would like to lose, of course, infinitely many points. So we would like to go to the mean field. So if I use infinitely many points, then I would have, in principle, for every choice of W, as many X points as I would have. Um, and so I could think of even say that instead of using a, sing a single W and many X points, since, both, since this quantity anyway needs to tend to infinity for the analysis later, I choose an extended spa state space and say that each particle carries its own W. So I have instead of X, um, uh, I have now the phase space of my particle system, which is X and W. So each particle, in some sense, solves its own minimization problem. And since I have so many particles, I will have for each quantity of W infinitely many X, which will solve this problem. So I can imagine that for each w choice of W, they will get give me some solution. In some sense, it's like going from a first order to a second order model. So WI is now like a velocity, if you want. Um, but first, first of all, so at the moment, there's no dynamics. So I just pick initially some values for W, and then I look at this. Clearly, I can write what is now the current best approximation for given WI. It's the same formula, just with WI. I have still my dynamics. And now I, I have only a computational advantage in some sense. So numerically, of course, I cannot let the number of particles tend to infinity. So I am now given these n particles. So I have to solve these problems, uh, n problems. So how does it look like? Well, it looks like this. So since every particle has now its own value of the parameterization of the front, I get, of course, um, a different approximation of, the, I get, of course, at diff, I get final values x alpha on different uh, points on the, on the curve of optimal points. You see, because I don't have well, I, this is a number a simulation with limited number of particles. So you see that they don't not necessarily nicely rely on the curve, not bef not as before, because there's two maybe two less particles at the moment. So if you would increase the number, it would get closer because you get a better estimate of the true minimum. And what you can also see if you then map these points towards the Pareto front, so the object you are really interested in you get some distribution of the particles along this. This distribution depends on your initial choice of the weights W. Yeah. Typically, of course, it's not known how long this curve is. So you make some choice, usually equidistant in W, um, and then you get this parameterization. And this, of course, is not, is not ideal. Um, and we will tackle this in the forthcoming uh, slides. The first thing what you would like to, to understand is, um, if I have now this dynamics, um, is there some convergence? And um, well, so as I said, so we are interested in the limit for infinitely many particles, so you do the mean field. Now you have an extended phase space system, so the, the analysis is a little to be modified from what was known in the literature, but essentially, what happens is that you just get a parameterized mean field equation by this value of W. And now you can repl uh, you can apply um, results which have been in the literature, which show you that first this limit exists. And second, that if the, the, that the long-term dynamics of this property actually converge to something which you want. So namely that it converges to an estimate on the mean of the, um, of the minimum along the Pareto front. And the details are here. So you need um, a certain growth condition in W. So this will be in the next slide. And then you have um, a couple of assumptions, which are actually, the, the, in particular, this one is the same as in the case when it's not parameterized, which is what's quite interesting to see, though, that um, here um, lambda is the strength of the drift. And sigma was sigma squared was the variance of the noise. So you need more drift than noise. This was also known before. And then the result which you would get 
um, which uh, is uh, by a paper of von Nazi, um, will I think speak tomorrow here, and uh, is a PhD student, um, is that if you fix some accuracy, um, then you run this model for a certain time, and you know that um, if alpha is sufficiently large, uh, the the variance between the, the dynamics and the true minimizer is less than the um, this accuracy. Um, so maybe one word about these conditions. Um, so this is a condition we need on this scalarization. So you see that it, you need an up, uh, upper and a lower bound for for this in terms of the true minimizer. So um, yeah, the other thing is actually quite similar to the result without parameter. So I don't want to go uh, into that for, for too much detail. So you need that this Laplace principle holds, which means that the alpha is sufficiently large. This re requires essentially that your true minimizer belongs to the support of this initial measure, which, um, okay, you need to guarantee. Um, and um, our rate, this was maybe the important thing here, this lambda is larger than sigma square. Um, is somehow in, is independent of the choice of these weights, but this is more or less, um, yeah, this comes actually out of this assumption. This is a quite strong assumption because you need these bounds to be um, somehow hold for all of these omegas which you choose, and um, yeah, this uh, could be quite difficult actually to check. Um, in any case, um, what what this tells you is that the particle di dynamics converges to the mean field and that the mean field gives you some rate on estimating the distance to the true minimizer under this assumption. So this is, um, yeah, this gives you somehow the, the foundation for why this method works. But it does not solve this problem that in the end, um, sorry, uh, this is... <laughs> pictures never stop but in the end you see if you look at this part here you don't capture actually the full Pareto font so somehow you have like with the swarm they, they form some some pattern but this would be not my desired pattern because I have a lot of points which capture somehow this part of the front but I have nothing here so in principle if I would not here yeah, I have drawn of course the true Pareto font which was known in this example but if I would not know the Pareto font, this would be a very bad result because I don't have any anything to cover this area here. And maybe this would be the area where some other some engineer or somebody who wants to use that in the end would be interested in. So the idea is then simple, uh, similar to what we saw before. So let's um, take a potential. Um, and um, so what we do is, um, so here's the example. If I would, so I take an explicit example with two cost functioners. Here is the omega space. So I will go back one slide. So the space capital omega is the space of these little omegas of the weights, and they should sum up to one. This has to be there, though in, in 1D it's just a simple, this is always a simplex, but uh, in different shapes, of course, depending on the dimension. And um, in if I have only one parameter, of course, uh, the, the line would look like this. So the WIs have to be between uh, 0 and 1, and this would be the space. And for those distribution of points, I would get, for one of these examples, I would get in the Pareto font, if I would solve with these weights, my minimization, my parameterized minimization problem, I would get this distribution for the image space. And clearly this is not, well, you have, it's not, I have not said what I, what I mean with a distance measure, but um, this doesn't look very satisfying. If I would, on the other hand, distribute them in image space like in in in, spa in the space omega like that, then I would get a nice equidistant distribution. Clearly, I don't know this function when I start, so um, but I have to choose some WIs to start, of course, the dynamics. So now, of course, the idea is like before. So we introduce a potential which would uh, push these points out, um, away from each other if they are too close. And this should, in principle, help me to give a, a, a better distribution of those along the front. Because there's no way that I can, even in high dimension, if you go beyond, say, two cost functions, there's no way that you can guess in this simplex how you should put the points in order to get the unknown Pareto front in the end. Or at least I don't. And so, therefore, the idea is 
we saw this before, to introduce a potential. So if you would look at this as a potential, um, short range repulsion, and if I would draw the potential in image space across these points, then you see that here you get a very high potential. This is the front, these would be the, the solutions. If you would distribute them al along this, you would get, of course, a, le uh, a less high potential, so because they, uh, they, of course, don't see each other here, and so they are pushed away. So if I would introduce a potential like this, what I would like to have is that the weights change in such a way that they minimize this potential. So I don't want to touch the dynamics for the position of the points for the x, because these are given by the Laplace principle. They should still converge to the true minimizer, so they should in the end still lie on this curve. But so far, I have, I have not done anything on the weights. I just drew them initially. So I would like to use now a dynamics on these weights in order to push them apart, in order to match better the, the spread on the Pareto front. So this means that, in principle, when you start uh, with these points close to each other, you would like to move them along this space. Now the problem is that um, you cannot do that directly in image space because this is um, you have only information on X and you can only evaluate in G and you would like to go back to this small W space. And as I said before, you don't want to change the X dynamics because this should still be driven by the Laplace principle. So you would like to have something on the Ws. And so the idea is now to derive something on that. So. This would be what you want to do ideally. So say you have a mapping of omega. This is the space where these little omegas live to the unknown Pareto front F. And say this mapping would be denoted by G star. Okay. Then for each of these double for each of the weights, um, I can compute, of course, what is the value uh, on this Pareto front. This is uh, DG. And so what I want to do is I want to push um, with some potential these points away. So in principle, I want to solve an equation like this, where I modify the g in such a way that it goes in direction of minus the gradient of this potential u, which depends, as in the talk before, on these two positions gi. Then, of course, I need to project, because um, the g is a cost function, and I'm only interested in the Pareto front, so I need to project from gi on the front. This is not an equation I can solve, but this is what should happen. Uh, and now I need to transfer this equation to an equation on the space omega, so to the weights uh, omega. And so one thing, okay, and so one thing you can do is you can formally differentiate here, then you get the derivative of g at this point vi, you put it on the other side, might not be invertible, and then you have a projection here again on this front. So now mm, this is still uh, not possible to solve because of this projection. So now you need to look at the dimension. And so for small dimensions, uh, they, for m equals 2, actually you can, comp because the, the shape is quite easy here, you can compute an approximation to both of these terms. So in the space m equals 2, you would get something like this for this one, and for the projection, you would get this. And um, this would be just a first order, essentially, expansion of these two operators. This is why there's an approximation sign. And so I we would replace this by a projection PT on this omega space of this little omega. This would be just this product of these two matrices. Um, and we put the minus, which is here, out. Therefore, there's no minus here, which was here. Okay. But in principle, this would be now our, our proposal dynamics. So we go in direction of the gradient of the potential. We project it towards um, the image space on, on omega. And this gives me an update for W. There's no change in the dynamics of, of X. The dynamics of X only enter, of course, through this GI, because this GI is a mapping of the current point to the front. Okay. So now what can we do with that? Um, Sorry. So, um, yeah, this is what I just said. Um, we employ this implicit, implicit um, mapping, and the question is, can we evaluate this? And um, so we don't have this, uh, this true f, and so what we do instead is we say that um, I take the Laplace principle again. So I take the best point, which I currently have, which was this x bar, 
um, and I map it with with a G with my given cost functionals, and I take this as an estimate on the Pareto fault. And clearly, um, this might not be true initially, and it might also not be true for for certain times because this Laplace principle only tells you, or this this convergence theorem we, before we had only tells me that if t is sufficiently large, then the then and alpha is sufficiently large, then my point x bar w is actually close to the minimum. Still, we don't have another choice available from the current dynamics, so we use this. So there are many. So what you can see is that this would be the ideal property which I want to have, but I cannot resolve this dynamically because I don't know the true Pareto front initially. I only know somehow this approximation given by the mapping of G to this um, estimate given by the Laplace principle. And I don't know this projection. Um, and I approximate this by going to the phase space in, in W. Still, um, the projection is needed. Um, it might not be an explicit formula, so we have now done this for M2 and M3, but for general, for more than this, it's, um, it's not clear um, that there is really an explicit formula, and it's also quite expensive to compute. In the end, you get the dynamics like this. There's one more point. So this is the original dynamics of this um, parameterized um, particle dynamics, which would tend to these uh, points, um, to these optimal points. Those are used then back here in G. The potential is evaluated, projected. And there's a little tour because, uh, of course, I can have different uh, time scales now. I have the time scale for the particle dynamics. And I can my, change now my weights um, on a different time scale. Might need to do that faster or slower, and we will see that one can get at least a, an estimate on this. Um, so then you can ask, uh, what kind of equation can you get out of this? Well, you could again ask uh, what happens in the limit n to infinity, and uh, you can write, um, well, the I didn't write the mean field, so I wrote the equation for the characteristic particle, but you can also write for this, it's the same mean, uh, mean field equation, which would be same as before, except that you now get a drift in the weight. And the drift in the weight is governed by the potential evaluated at x. Um, then you can ask, what can you say about this mean field equation? Um, so it will be now high phase it will be a higher dimensional phase space because you have positions and dynamics and weight. And so what we would like to look at is at a particular subsolution of that one because I would like to understand if I'm already somehow at the optimal point with the particle dynamics, mm, do I get really what I wanted? Do I really get a decay of my potential? So this would mean that uh, the dynamics is uh, done in such a way that you are always on the Pareto front, and now the particles only move along the Pareto front. And if these, uh, if our modeling and our approximations are reasonable, then we would expect that this potential decreases after this. Um, so, yeah, this will come on the next slide where I just said the so one. Maybe I show this first and then I come back here. So this is the dynamics again. This was the potential, which give me this drift. And now what happens is if I'm on this point, so if I'm really with a distribution on my optimal point, can I, def can I get a, um, a dynamics for the marginal with respect to W? So that I can see that this decays. So I substitute this ansatz in the mean field equation. I integrate out. And then I get a, the only dynamics which is related to the drift, which looks like this, um, which has now the g bar here, which is now evaluated at the optimal point. And this is an equation which has been studied in the literature before. So it's uh, non-local because of this interaction, um, but it's on a bounded domain because the w still needs to be on this simplex, of course. But uh, luckily, there is a result um, in, uh, yeah, given in this paper, which we could adapt to our case. So if you have this problem, so if you are on the, on the optimal Pareto front, then you would actually see that these particles distribute, or in the sense that they minimize 
the potential. So the potential decreases with a certain rate depending um, on this projection and on the potential. So on the optimal planetal front, you should expect to see that, this that the particles redistribute. So then I skipped three slides and those are on the time scale. So I said that we can add a time scale here. So this is a modeling problem, right? So the weights are choices of us. So we can also add a time scale tau here. And the question is, how should you do that? And um, well, what you can check is um, if the previous convergence result, what would it say um, when you apply it to this dynamics? And so remember, there was um, a relation between the drift and uh, the noise between lambda and sigma squared. So um, it's expected because this is a drift term that this will also enter the drift. And the way it enters is um, as follows. So this constant C will be explicit on the next slide. But essentially, it says that um, uh, you somehow lose something because, um, of course, before you had the drift to the minimum, now you with changing w's so you somehow have a moving target so you some change these uh the point to which you converge because you change the weight all the time so first of all this means that you need some regularity on this mapping which gives you um for a fixed weight the optimal point on the pareto form um so this would unfortunately then exclude this um, <laughs> Chebyshev parameterization with the maximum before. So this is a very quite strong assumption, honestly. So now you have a you have the particle system which has this somehow moving target, um, and you know that this target behaves in a smooth way, but still um, this hinders, of course, your drift. So which means that you need to have more drift on the on the Laplace principle, um, and you need more we, uh, in the following sense. So tau has to be of the well tau over square root of epsilon has to be less than this lambda. And epsilon was, uh, and mind you, was a, in the convergence result was the threshold, right? So in the end you would like would wanted to have this result, and there was this epsilon. So this tells you that you should do that on an order which is related to the square root of your tolerance. And the, that it's reasonable that they have different time scales. Okay. Um, yeah, here's then the exact function C, though, but it's not the exact constant. So this one you might still estimate, but there's no chance that you get this because this depends on the true Pareto font. So I'm not sure if it's actually worthwhile, but in case um, you know this, you can actually make a pre more precise estimate. Otherwise, you just go with square root of epsilon. Okay, now we have the time scale. We have um, a result which tells us that actually the points will distribute. And now we can look at some pictures, I think. Um, and so here you see uh, two parameters. So, pr so there are a couple of standard problems for multi objective minimization. Um, and yeah, one is the Lamé problem with a certain coefficient. Um, I have not written the problem here, but this is the Pareto front. Um, and the first thing is that you put no potential to the previous method, and you see that, okay, you you miss some part of this um, of this Pareto front. And then there are different potential. Um, in the previous talk, we have seen the most potential, and this is also the nicest here. So you see that now you have a nice fit. On, um, on the Pareto front. And now you can, of course, also, so we always start with equidistant um, distribution of the WIs, but then we let them evolve according to this most potential. And in the end, you will see here the histogram of the weights on the omega space. So you will see that they are um, here when you don't do anything, you see that they are equidistant. And now here there's some distribution of these weights. You also see, um, yeah, we are now moving targets. So um, you see that here's one of one of these points still didn't make it to the full Pareto front. So either time was too short, particles were not enough, um, yeah, or parameters were not estimated properly. So this is this is, you, this is um, in some sense a simple problem because the okay you get a continuous Pareto front, and it also um, has a nice concavity factor. But you can do the same thing when you lose this um, this particular structure. Then this problem has a different name, different parameters, and you can also do that when the Pareto font is discontinuous, right? So like here, 
again, when you do the um, the case with no potential, you have only one point to capture this arc. Here with the most potential, you get more, but you also get points which are here. And they, what happens with those, they usually jump between those. And since I stop at a certain time, um, so they don't jump, they move, right, between different points because they are repulsed here and attracted here and vice versa, so they go back and forth. Um, and so since I stop my simulation at a certain point, you, you still get these remaining parts, which will not happen, of course, if you have a fixed weight. So this is clearly, uh, if you want, if you are, this is clearly a drawback of this um, somehow repulsive formula. Here's the distribution again on the weights. And I think uh, I have one more slide with, uh, you can also do that. Um, this is uh, very nice that Giacomo Borghi was able to do that. Can also do that with three cost functionals. Looks much more fancy, but same idea, right? So now we have two cost functionals, one, two, three. You have a three dimensional object. In the, uh, in the left, you have the case of no potential and you now this Pareto front becomes a, uh, Pareto surface, and you see that you have a very poor representation of the points on the surface. This is with equi this uh, equ equ uh, with weights which are distributed equally on this simplex, and uh, this is now with the most potential, get much better representation of this um, surface, and this is then the final distribution of the weights which. Initially, you probably wouldn't have guessed that this would be one. And this is still um, the case for um, yeah, this uh, convex domain. And you can also do that in those domains. It's even more impressive that you see that you get no points actually here and here. Here, it's still probably not the best choice. So you still miss a couple of extremes. But I would say it's still better approximation. Mm. So I have one slide to summarize. So, um, so particles are here used. Um, in order, uh, so say the behavior of particles is used in order to approximate essentially shapes. Um, and we use that to um, rewrite multi objective problems as parameter dependent minimization problems, where we um, use, say, the extended phase space of these particles or agents uh, to get a good approximation on this front using these potentials, as we have seen. We can do non convex and discontinuous. Uh, well, this, so we see there's still things to do. Um, computation of this projection is still expensive. And so if we go to really high dimensions, maybe this is not uh, worthwhile doing this. So this means a lot of cost functionals. Um, but then maybe you can also get um, something which was also mentioned before. Maybe we can get some hydrodynamics. So either by adding um, an external force field like the fluid, or by doing moments, this would be a thing I was thinking about, and moments with respect to M in order to get to reduce also the computation time. And of course, you can apply this. This was now an example for parameter dependent problem, which comes from a specific uh, setup of this multi objective. But in principle, you can also think of applying this to other parameter dependent problems where, which you want to solve subsequently with these uh, particle dynamics. And so there's plenty of things to do. I'd like to thank also Giacomo and uh, Lorenzo for joining this work and also, of course, uh, the audience for listening. And I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for the exciting talk. Are there any questions from the audience? Matteo. So thank you, Michael. Uh, do you have any idea how to choose this potential in particular to, I mean, how to optimize the, the choice of the potential? And second question, uh, are you always sure that, I mean, we prevent blow up in W? No. I, I'm <laughs> The simple answer is uh, for both cases, no. <laughs> so uh, there's no mechanism which would prevent this uh, blow up in W initially. And um, regarding the choice of the potential, it's honestly like this, that we looked in the literature what was around and we tried them and then looked at the results. Um, but I don't have a good intuition um, why the one potential works better than the other. Uh, but I was hoping that maybe this was <laughs> given also by the previous talk, is that 
depending on the potential, you get certain steady states with certain stability patterns, right? And so maybe this would give me a better understanding on which potential to choose and how this depends. The only thing is that one probably needs to make a certain assumptions on the desired Pareto font, which you want, because uh, it's, um, somehow these things are related. The, the, this potential pushes along this Pareto font, so I need probably a good assumption on my final shape of this Pareto font in order to make good assessment of uh, this potential to use. The only uh, thing is that um, if you look at these numerical results, depending if it's a problem for your simulation, if this happens or not, or depending if this is a problem for further applications, one can say that uh, with any potential, the results regarding the distribution along the front are better than without potential. So this is uh, somehow the only thing I can say now. Um, and this is expected because it was built in in order to, to get this distribution. But which one? I would say maybe a stability analysis could be a, a way to analyze this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I have just a small curiosity. Yeah. Um, in one of your initial slides, so when you were kind of differentiating between making distinction yeah. between the fact that uh, in one case you had the points that we distributed on the uh, yeah. simplex uh, and in the other case they were not that we distributed. Yeah, maybe like the, this, yeah. No, it was in the green one in the W, ah, yeah. yeah. So is it just an artifact of the image or that distribution very much looks like the Chebyshev notes for when you do interpolation? <laughs> So for this one, yeah. uh, so it depends on the example, right? Okay. So uh, for that one, you are right. Uh, here, uh, so there are certain problems. Let's formulate it like this. Multi-objective minimization problems where, in particular in 2D, where it's known where these optimal points are, and then it would be precisely the Trebitreff integration points. To go to a higher dimensions, not necessarily the case, right? And um, also is a question if you can actually, this would mean, if you would know this optimal location of the points, then you would just compute them a priori, right? And then use this as a fixed point and then get this. But um, as I said, so if you go to three or four, it's, uh, it's impossible to get somehow this. And it only works also for a particular, I forgot now if it's really only for concave, but it certainly doesn't work for discontinuous Pareto forms, right? So, um, but in this case, yes, <laughs> yeah, all right. Okay, thank you very much. So if there are no more questions from the audience, uh, I think we can thank Michael again. Thank you. All right. So today's final talk is by Daniela Tonon from the University of Padova, and her title is Minfield Games Planning Problems with General Initial and Final Measures. Thank you. So welcome back. So first of all, let me thank you, the organizer, for this very nice invitation. Uh, what I'm talking about today is an ongoing project with Francisco Silva from uh, University of Limoges, and is about Minfield Games planning problem. So first of all, let me introduce to you what are Minfield Games. So we are dealing with games, so with rational agents that would like to minimize a cost. And what is particular about Minfield Games system is that we have uh, an infinite number of agents playing it with each other. All the agents are indistinguishable in our case and are going to minimize the cost. So the simple example that we can have in mind is that our audience here, we are here following my talk. Imagine that at a certain point the talk finished and we all would like to go out drinking something. So the point is that what we want to do is that we want to exit this room in, with the shortest pass in the shorter time. So we all have the same cost to minimize. Of course, we won't follow all of us the same strategy because otherwise we will go up on the others. But the idea is that we have to interact with each other. Imagine that maybe it's more comfortable to be not too crowded and to go out slowly following uh, some strategy that each one of us is going to imagine differently. So the point is that even if it's a game and we have from the fact that we have in an infinite number of players, we won't see the interaction one by one, but more the interaction of the single with all the crowd that is going to surround him. 
So the classical version of the mean field game system is given by two equations that are coupled. The first one is an hamilton jacobi equation, that is the one that we see here, for phi, that is the value function of the single player. So there is a player that has a cost, and its cost satisfies this uh, uh, equation here, that is an hamilton jacobi equation with an Hamiltonian h that is convex in the second variable, and a coupling f that depends on m, that is the density of the player, so the crowd that is going to interplay. So this coupling usually is taken increasing with respect to the measure m when we want to uh, modelize something in which is a, a model in which the player don't like to be too close to each other. So the cost, this f will be part of the cost, will increase when there are too many people around. So the second equation is the equation for uh, the probability density of the population and is a classical uh, continuity equation or Fokker-Planck equation that depends also on the cost uh, function here through this part that is the, uh, let's say, the vector field that is going to move the mass in this way. I will enter a bit into the details. Uh, in this classical version, I also introduce uh, a second order term uh, that can be present or not, uh, that in a way regularizes the situation, and I will describe it in a minute later on. Uh, and then the two equations are seen, the first one is a backward one, so we give the value, the final value of the cost function, while the first one is a forward one, so the second one is a forward one, so we give the initial value of the mass of the population. So we know where the population of agents starts and what is the final cost of the typical agent, and we want to see how, they, uh, how the situation behaves in this way. Um, so usually to avoid boundary condition, we restrict to the torus in order to have a bit of compactness. And so this is the classical mean field game system. Um, what I'm going to deal about today is a slightly modification of this problem that is called the planning problem in which instead of giving the final value of uh, the value function, we give the final value of the population. So we are dealing with something that is a planning in the sense that there is, let's say, an external agent that knows where the population starts and where the population ends. In the example I gave you here, the beginning, at the beginning, we are all seated and at the end, we are all outside drinking. And um, let, let allow the, the, the population, the agents, to uh, optimize their costs individually but fixing the initial and the final value of the, the mass population. So the idea is that I'm going to tell you something about the results that are already known in this, for this problem. So whenever we can say that the solution exists in our classical solution, and then we are going to remove a little the regularity on the initial and final value, trying to go to the case in which uh, the initial and final value of the measure are uh, just measure, so no regularity at all imposed. This is still an ongoing project, but I think that is very nice to see uh, how we can, uh, in a way, adapt the results that we already know to, to this case. And also the aim is that, as you can imagine, this kind of problem is very close to the optimal transport problem, because in a way we want to transport the mass from a point from a configuration to another one. So techniques coming from optimal transport can be used in order, in order to uh, solve this problem. And this is what I'm going to show you. Okay, uh, so again, I stress these two equations are coupled. We can see this from two po the point of view. The fact that the first one, the Hamilton-Jacobi equation, depends on the measure, the unknown of the second equation, and vice versa, the second equation depends on the unknown of the first equation. This is not the case in the optimal transport problem because it's slightly different, but we will see. Okay, so... In this case, I can also say, uh, since we are not giving any value for the final uh, value function, this will be a degree of freedom that can be chosen in order to optimize the system. 
Okay, so just to see a bit more uh, in the details, what is the optimal control problem behind this problem? Uh, we have a player, every player has a dynamic. This, this dynamic is given here, where there is a control V, deterministic one, and then a Brownian according to the fact that we have or not the second order value that I showed you before. So this new has to be positive in order to have uh, some uh, Brownian motion. Then the M0 and MT, the initial and final value of the density are in a way the low of this uh, process function that we have here. And then the cost of the player, what the play, every player has to minimize is given by this expectation. So we have here the usual Lagrangian cost that is the Legendre transform of the Hamiltonian that depends on the control. Uh, the sign depends on what we are dealing with, but let's keep it like this. And then the coupling function F. So if you remember, I told you that we usually take F increasing with respect to M when we want to deal with a, a crowd that don't like to be too concentrated because the cost of the small player, of the typical player, will increase if F increases with respect to M. Okay, so with F increasing, we are saying that the players do not like to be too close to each other. That is the case when we go out from the, the room, saying that, okay, we want to exit as soon as possible, but maybe just in a comfortable way without doing like this with the others. So um, whenever uh, the player wants to minimize uh, this cost, what it turns out formally is that the uh, control V that has to be chosen in order to minimize this cost the formal one is given by the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the uh, second variable, like this, evaluated in the value function. And if you remember, this was precisely the vector field that was inside the um, Fokker Planck equation. Indeed, if every player chose this one as a control, then the mass will naturally evolve with the classical Kolmogorov equation or focal Planck equation or continuity equation, different name for the same stuff, the equation I showed you before. So that's why the second equation, the one that rules the evolution of the mass of the population has this cost inside, uh, this uh, vector field inside, given driven by this. Okay, so this should give you more uh, an idea of what is the control problem. This is the value function, and actually the value function satisfies the Hamilton-Jacobi equation I showed you before. Okay, so let me just give you a review of uh, existing results about uh, existence and uniqueness of solution of this problem. Uh, so let's start with the first result about uh, classical solution that were given by Lyons. So he was able to prove existence and uniqueness. Uh, let me say uniqueness is of course up to a constant for the value function because I'm not fixing the final value. Uh, in the deterministic case, so in the absence of the second order term de Laplacian, so when a nu is equal to zero, in dimension one, for an Hamiltonian that is uh, super linear, smooth, strictly convex, uh, a coupling that is strictly increasing and smooth, and uh, the first and the initial and final value that are smooth and strictly positive. So the strict positivity of M0 and MT is very important because uh, as soon as M0 and MT, in the places where they are zero, uh, we lack regularity of the value function. Uh, so you will see uh, in most of the time we will require strictly positive uh, uh, initial and final measure. For the regularity, that's what we are, I'm showing to you that we can work on the regularity. So the idea behind this result is the fact that actually it is possible to uh, reduce the system to a uniform reality one and use some Bernstein method to get estimates on the gradient. To obtain this estimate, you need a priori lower bounds on the measure. And actually, that's why here the dimension is equal to one. These uh, bounds are easy to obtain when D is equal to one, a bit more difficult in the case greater than one, so that this result is not yet proved when D is greater than one, not in this form, not under this generality. 
In the second order case, it's a bit easy, more uh, it's a bit more easy because of the fact that we have the Laplace that is in a way regularizing. And when the Hamiltonian is uh, uh, quadratic or uh, at infinity close to a quadratic one, a coupling that is non-decreasing, smooth and bounded, M0 and the theta are smooth and strictly positive. Via a transformation that is an off cold transformation, it is possible to reduce this uh, coupled system to a unique equation. And via this equation that is semilinear and parabolic, you can prove the fact that the solution is uh, classic. So these are results for classic solution. And Lyons also stated that actually under an Hamiltonian that is sublinear, uh, if you choose an M0 that is different from MT, so an initial configuration okay. different from the, the final one, then uh, if T is small enough, it's possible to show that there are no solutions. So when the Hamiltonian is a sublinear, uh, finding solution is a bit more difficult. Then, of course, there are results in the direction of obtaining less regular solution. Uh, so we start with solution that are solution in the sense of distribution and Poretta proved that in the second order case, so in the presence of the Laplacian, for an Hamiltonian that is a bit, that is a bit more general, uh, so strictly convex with no precise asymptotic at infinity, uh, but still with a quadratic growth, F non-decreasing, again starting from a regular initial and final measure, Using energy method, it is possible to find some compactness and stability to prove that there are, that there are weak solution. But then uh, uh, proving that this weak solution enjoys more regularity uh, is a bit more difficult and is not yet proved. From the point of view of numerical results, uh, there is a paper by Ashdu, Camilli, and Capuzzo Dolcetta that uh, actually try to, and this is kind of interesting, uh, solve and cope with this planning problem uh, via penalization. So you can think of the planning problem of, of the planning problem as a classical mean field games where uh, instead of fixing the final measure, you put the final measure in the cost of the uh, small player. So the final cost in a way is, a penaliz is penalized saying that if you are too far from the final measure that you want to join, then you are paying a lot. So the, the agent is then obliged to uh, reach, in a way, with all the others, the final configuration. And in this way, at least numerically, it is possible to approximate the classical uh, planning problem and via some uh, semi-implicit scheme. So this is a possibility. It's not the way we use to solve the planning problem, but still interesting. So let me now reduce to the case of a first order planning problem to go a bit more in the direction of showing similarities via, with the transport problem, the optimal transport problem. So I reduce to a quadratic Hamiltonian, not only because we have seen that the quadratic growth is in a way easier, but just to show you uh, to fix the idea because we can put whatever P power greater or equal than two here but still it's a bit better to, to see the, the situation, how the situation here is. So no Laplacian in the two equation, and uh, uh, let us fix the, the idea to this problem. Okay. So this problem is very close to the optimal transport one, the one that we see here. So this is a monch kantorovich mass transfer problem. You want to uh, move a measure to another one, optimizing this cost, minimizing the quadratic cost here. And actually, uh, Benamou and Brenier uh, introduced a fluid mechanics formulation of this problem given by the, cap the coupled system that is here. That is precisely an hamilton jacobi equation and a continuity equation. The only difference from the system that I showed you before is that we don't have the coupling here at this, in this part. The point is that we are only optimizing something that depends on the distance, on the square of the distance, but not the cost that is given from the interaction of the population. So as you can see, this coupled system is very close to the one that I showed you. So techniques coming from this problem can be used to solve also, maybe, hopefully, and this is the case, the problem that I showed you. 
Okay, so in this direction, uh, several papers appeared uh, exploiting techniques from optimal transport uh, and using this technique to cope with the planning problem. So there is a paper by Orietta Porieri and Savare that was able to prove the existence and uniqueness of weak solution using this variational structure of the problem. They were working on the whole space RD, so removing the uh, compactness of the torus with a convex Hamiltonian with quadratic growth and increasing coupling with polynomial growth. And then they started reducing the regularity of M0 and T to L1, weighted L1 function with um, finite second order momentum. So instead of requiring that this, in the initial and final measure are regular, less regular, at least L1 with finite second order momentum. Then there are other results by Gomez and collaborators that use the displacement convexity properties in order to uh, found a priori bounds for solution of the first order planning problem. And also in the case still uh, a priori estimate still for the first order mean field planning problem with a potential, still using a potential approach. Uh, okay. And uh, recent results were obtained in the case of a finite state space for the plan planning problem by Bertucci, Lesri, and Lyons, but this is not in the direction that we are going to deal. They also had common noise. And then there is a result by Munoz that I want to quote because uh, I told you the fact that the results by Lyons work only in the dimension one. It is possible to general, generalize that results to arbitrary dimension, adding this condition here. So unboundedness at zero for the coupling. So the coupling depends on the measure. I told you the fact that the measure is equal to zero is a problem. The points where the measure is equal to zero is a problem. So adding this condition allows to cope a bit more with that point and allows to obtain the estimates that were required to apply the ellipticity and the Bernstein method and so on to cope with the uh, um, classical solution, to obtain classical solution, also in arbitrary dimension. The result by Munoz is a result in the classical mean field games, not for planning problem, but was then generalized to the planning problem by Porretta, at least when the coupling is, half, is given by a log m, like this. And Poretta also showed that actually uh, adding uh, a kind of penalization uh, via uh, an entropic, adding an, an entropic cost as a penalization, it's possible to um, stabilize a bit the problems and cope better with uh, the uh, instability that is given by uh, the, the points where m is equal to zero. So he added a term like this to recover the ellipticity and uh, uh, obtain still uh, regularized solution. And again, in the first order case, uh, Munoz with a colleague, Mimikos Stamatopoulos, were, was able to remove this condition in the first order, in the one dimension case, just to have an idea of what is going on in this case. But now I would like to concentrate a bit more on the techniques that uh, I want to generalize to obtain the results in the case of a general initial and final measure. So um, there is a, the, the idea is that we want to use convex optimization problem. And what I'm going to show you is a result that I obtained with Jameson Graber, Al Parmesaros, and Francisco Silva that uh, in that case required that the initial and final measure is L1, but that I want to generalize to the case of initial and final measure that are just measures. So the idea is that uh, we want to use a variational uh, technique that was already used in the case of mean field games, classical mean field games by Cardalia Gay and collaborators for the first order case and the second order case with the possibly degenerate part. So this idea was introduced by Benamo and Brenier and then generalized by Cardalia Gay, Carli and Nazare, still in the optimal transport context. So some uh, introduction to the problem. What are the hypotheses that we are going to use? We require that the coupling that is here grows as a power 
q minus one of the measure m. So it's increasing with respect to m with this condition. And q has to satisfy a condition that depends on the dimension in order to obtain regular solution. And we, in this case, just require that the M0, MT are L1 positive probability measure. So we will need to, to work a bit with uh, duality in our case. So let me construct a kind of primitive of uh, the little f coupling that I showed you before. So just kind of integrating. This capital F will grow as a power Q in M. And then I will construct the Finchel conjugate of this F in this way, classically. And this uh, Finchel conjugate will grow as a power Q prime, where Q prime is uh, precisely the convex conjugate of Q, just to have an idea. And of course, F uh, will be strictly convex because the little f was increasing, and the Finchel conjugate will stay strictly convex. OK, so what are the two optimal control problems in duality? The first one is an optimal control problem for the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. So the state function, the state variable phi, the value function of the small player, is controlled by a distributed control alpha that depends on time and space in order to optimize this criterion that is here. So this is the Fenchel conjugate of capital F, the one that I just introduced before. And then we have here the presence of the initial, the final value P coupled with M and the initial value of P0 coupled with M0. And the state is driven by the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. So this is the functional driven by this condition. So the functional can be rewritten like this, including the condition of the Hamilton-Jacobi equation here. And we are going to find the infimum, if possible, of this quantity over function that are C2. So very regular. Imagine that we, it is possible, this is not the case, but at least this is how it works, that there are classical solutions to this problem. So we want to optimize this one. This problem is dual to a second one that is the optimal control problem for the Fokker-Planck equation. So in this case, we control the state variable M, that is the distribution of the population, via a vector field V, that is this one, in order to minimize this function that we have here, that is very similar to the one that is the, let's say, is very close to the value function of the small player, but it's not the same because we have an M here. And instead of, instead of having the little f, there is the capital F here, so the primitive. So this is the kinetic energy, and this one is the energy given by the cost, by the interaction of the population, the capital F. And M solves the Fokker-Planck equation. So this functional scene like this, with, that depends on M and V, is not convex in this way. So we need to slightly modify it in order to uh, maintain convexity. And the idea is that instead of putting V times m here, we consider another variable that is w. So we think of the functional as depending on m and w, where w is the product between m and v. And with respect to m and w, this functional, the one that I showed before and then uh, I will rewrite it, is now convex. So we maintain convexity in this way. So we will require that uh, we want to minimize this functional on function m that are just L1, so not so much regularity, w in L1, m that is a measure, so we have probability density, so with interval equal to one, positive, satisfies the continuity equation with the initial and final condition in the sense of distribution. So in this case, we are not requiring the same regularity that was required for the value function. In the sense of distribution means that via test function, the condition, the equation is satisfied in, in an integral way. And the functional now is this one, where instead of writing V here, we just write W divided by M, because W was the product by uh, V times M in this way. So that we have convexity. Of course, uh, the thing that I'm writing here doesn't make sense in the case M is equal to zero. But if m is equal to zero, this quantity takes the value plus infinity 
if w is different from zero or zero if w is equal to zero. So what it turns out is that now we have these two problems and it's po it is possible to show that these two problems are in duality. Indeed, using the fenchel rockefeller duality theorem, it is possible to show that finding the infimum of the first problem on the set of functions that are regular, the C2 function, is precisely equal to finding minus the minimum. And the fact that it is a minimum is given by the theorem, the fenchel rockefeller duality theorem, of the functional that I showed before. So the, the, the two problems are now in duality. So what is the idea now? Why I'm going to, why we want to cope with this problem more than with the two equations that I showed before? The idea is that we would like to find that the infimum here and the minimum here, so given by the fenchel rockefeller duality theorem, and then eventually, if it's possible to find a minimum here, are precisely the solution of the minfield game system. And vice versa, the solution of the minfield game system can be the optimizer here. So this is the idea, linking uh, the minimizers with uh, the solution of the, of the minfield game system. So this minimum here is obtained via the duality theorem as a unique pair and Working a bit, we can also show that the pair M and W enjoys more regularity, so that M is in LQ and uh, W in this space here. So this duality works, the equivalence works also when the initial and final measure are just a class, uh, general measure, while the fact that we have more regularity requires that M0 and T are in L1. Okay. So in order to construct the solution of the minfield games problem, we also need to find an infimum here. But this is not possible in general. We don't expect this problem to have a solution. So we need to relax. So the idea is that we slightly change this problem, introducing a second variable alpha, and changing the space k0 with this one, where we are looking for solutions that are only bv, uh, value function that are only BV and alpha that are in LQ prime, but still satisfies the Hamilton Jacobi equation, in this case, in the sense of distribution as an inequality. So we will reduce the regularity of the solution and the way the equation satisfies the, 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 the solution satisfies the equation. So changing this functional in this way, it's possible to prove that actually finding this infimum is equivalent to finding this one. So the two are equivalent. And of course, since this was equal to this one, we will also have this inequality. Okay, and now finding the infimum of that problem is easier. So it is possible to show that the relaxed problem is at least uh, one solution. And actually this solution is older. Formally, how we obtain the solution via this condition here uh, that comes from the fact that actually when we have the duality, we have that the infimum of a problem is equal to the max to the minus the minimum of the other, gives this integral condition that is here, and removing the integral formally and uh, re rewriting the, this. Uh, in this way, we can find phi zero has this condition here. And this uh, formula here can be seen as an integral version of the lax olenic formula. Uh, I'm telling you this because this makes a link with uh, the optimal transport technique that I'm going to, to show you, just to point out. Okay, so we are now able to say what kind of solution we are going to find. So there will be weak solution. The value function will be in BV the density m will be in LQ with some regularity of the derivative here. The Hamilton-Jacobi equation will be solved as an inequality in the sense of distribution. The continuity equation will be solved as a, in the sense of distribution as an equality in this way. And then we will also say that uh, the couple phi and m is a solution if this equality, this integral equality is satisfied. 
This integral equality is the one that I showed you before that comes from the duality. And with this definition, actually, we are able to, see, to say that there exists a weak solution to the mean field games. How? Exactly from the fact that we are able to find minimizer of this problem, and through the minimizer, we recover exactly weak solution for the mean field game system. And actually, the opposite direction is also true. This weak solution of the mean field game system gives optimizers of the problem. But in, in general, it's easier to find this and to use this to, to solve the mean field game system. We also have uniqueness in the sense that, of course, the uniqueness of M was already given by the Fenchel Rockefeller theorem, while the uniqueness of the value function is given up to a constant in the set where M is positive. Also because uh, where M is zero, I already said that there are some problems in the regularity. Okay, so now I want to show you a bit the idea of how generalized the results that we have already seen to the case in which M0 and MT are just a uh, uh, general measure. So the, the idea is that I want to come back to the mons kantorovich problem and show you a result for this problem in this case that we are going to see if it's possible to generalize to our case and to see what happens. So again, uh, classical transport uh, problem with M0 and MT that are just measure. There is a result by Cloé Jimenez uh, that actually uh, gives some uh, equivalence between this problem and coupled equation that are the hamilton jacobi one and a slightly different version of the continuity equation because now the M is not so regular. So what is the result? Uh, the theorem given by Jimenez says that exactly there is a um, duality between the problem that I just showed before, that is the P, and these two optimal problems. The first one is the problem of maximizing this quantity here. So you can see, as before, the coupling between the final value of the measure and the value function, the initial value of the measure and the value function. We don't have the capital F because in the optimal transport, there is no coupling present. And this problem is the problem of maximizing this under the condition of the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. So here F is zero, that's why we don't have the problem. So this is precisely the same A functional that I showed before. And uh, actually, is already written here as a maximum. So saying that there is a maximum, you remember before I need to, to relax in order to find the minimum, the difference between maximum and minimum is also because I don't have a minus here with respect to the equation I showed you before in the mean field game case. But the optimizer here is obtained via a lax Olenek formula. So that's why I was giving you, uh, underlying you that that condition that I showed you before is a kind of a generalization of Laxolenic formula because here is, is, it's precisely what is used in order to find the maximum. The second problem is the problem of minimizing a functional that is this one. This H is not the Hamiltonian, but is this function here that you can see is very close to the one that I showed before that depended on M and W. The Fokker-Planck equation is written in a slightly different way, but just because now we have measure with no absolute continuity, not necessarily absolutely continuous. And here uh, there is the T and X variable together. So D plus one, that's why. But if you think of this as a divergence in TX, the first term is uh, the derivative with respect to T and then the divergence in X. So it makes sense with respect to what we had before. And this is only a different way to write the initial and final condition for uh, the measure. So this is the equivalent of the B problem that we had before. And uh, what she was able to say, maybe I will skip this way, it was just to say that actually the lax olenic formula is the one that we can use uh, in order to cope with uh, finding the solution. But I want, don't want to enter into the details. Again, so this is make more sense is the op-flux formula, maybe make more sense. But the idea is that uh, 
finding a solution for the Mons Kantorovich problems is equivalent to finding a solution of this coupled equation. So the Hamilton Jacobi equation, the Fokker Planck equation, and then another condition that is here, where here we have the tangential gradient because phi is not necessarily um, it's not necessarily regular with respect to the measure mu, let's say. Um, so this condition here is actually what generalizes the integral version that I wrote in the condition of a um, viscosity solution that I showed before, the fact that there was this integral uh, condition. Why? Let me just check. So if you do the duality, the fact that the minimum is equal to the maximum, you rewrite the condition, and then you apply the fact that the divergence satisfies this condition here, so you integrate, and then you pass the derivative on the other side, imagine that phi is regular, you obtain precisely the condition, this one. This h sigma is equal to this. So this condition comes precisely from the duality as the integral one I showed before was obtained by via the duality. So here. Let me just go back to the results maybe. So the idea is that uh, understanding a bit better how uh, Jimenez obtained this uh, and generalizing this to the case of the mean free gain system, it is possible to obtain a duality result even in the case in which the initial and final measure are just a uh, measure and you don't, don't have the L1 regularity that was uh, necessary before. So the structure of the proof should be more or less the same as the one that I showed before via the duality. The point is that uh, uh, to obtain the minimizer, we need to find the correct generalization of this Lux-Solenic formula. And then uh, we need to cope a bit with this condition uh, in order to see, to obtain something that is uh, closer to this instead of the integral form that we had before. So I'll probably just go to the... open problems that are left. So once we are able to uh, precise generalize these results, as I showed you, uh, other possibility are uh, obtaining the same results in the second order degenerate case, trying to deal uh, uh, also actually to generalize the results that are for classical mean field games in the case in which the initial me measure is uh, just a measure that is not yet obtained and then trying to see what happens in the mean field tight control problems when we have some uh, general initial measure or a congestion case. Uh, so the fact that the Hamiltonian depends on the, the measure as well. And I thank you for your attention. Very much. Thank you very much, Daniela. Are there any questions from the audience? Yeah. Very interesting talk. Thank you. First, maybe a stupid question. Um, so the fact that you can actually uh, join uh, mu zero and mu t with an admissible path uh, comes from assumption that you put on phi, uh, right? Yeah. On the yeah, yeah, yeah. control. And another one. Uh, um, do you think it's will be interesting to study the case in which uh, uh, mu zero and mu t are, are not uh, of the same mass, like uh, not both so probability. not both probability. Uh, yes, but of course interesting. The point is that, I mean, with the continuity equation, there is a preservation of mass. Yeah, yeah, of course so you, you need you to change have a, the problem. A so term, once uh... you change correctly the problem, of course it could be interesting. Uh, there are results. Uh, not sure in the planning case, but in the mean field games general one, you can have some loss of mass with agents that are exiting. Yeah. So maybe in this direction, we can do something. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you, Daniela. Very interesting talk. I was just wondering because one sees quite often the stores framework. Why is this actually done? And is it interesting from point of view of application? Because you wrote that to escape uh, boundary condition, but let us suppose it was the whole space. Can you still do it? So something? Uh, there are results on the whole space. The one by Orieri, Porretta, and Savare was done uh, in RN, and other started to do this result. The point is that. Uh, especially, for example, when you talk about a uh, weak solution, you are integrating by paths. So if you don't have boundary terms, it's better, but you can work also with the condition that are uh, Neumann condition or something like this. So there are other type of results. Uh, the point is that in that case, they are still dealing with initial conditions that are very regular or something like this. So since we wanted to generalize to less regular initial condition and final condition, we started from something that was a bit more uh, understanded up to now. So that's why, but of course, makes more sense for the application. <laughs>